Um, we are back with the um, Living with Dementia Help and Hope Conference. And um, now we're going to have a panel discussion with uh, subject matter experts, with uh, professionals who um, practice in various fields of, uh, of um, dementia care and elder law and, and hospice and others um, every day. And so, um, first of all, I'd like to um, welcome each of our panelists and ask if they would tell a little bit about themselves. Um, and I'm going to go in alphabetical order. So, um, Gaines Brake is an, uh, an attorney uh, with uh, Maynard Cooper. So, Gaines, would you tell us a little bit more about your experience in elder law and uh, other, other things that you do as an attorney. So uh, thanks for having me again. Uh, it's an it's a honor and a privilege to talk to you as it is uh, anytime I get the opportunity to, to talk about dementia caregiving, elder care, and the law and the intersection of those things, uh, which is a particular interest to me. Um, as Ellen mentioned, I'm an attorney with Maynard Cooper and Gale in, uh, in the in Birmingham office. I'm part of uh, a nationwide healthcare practice group at the firm, and my particular niche in that group is elder care uh, from the perspective of healthcare providers. Uh, and I've, I've not always been on that side of the uh, picture. I began my career uh, as an elder care or an elder law attorney, helping individuals deal with uh, the, the um, challenges of aging and planning uh, for incapacity and, and healthcare planning issues. Uh, so I had uh, I spent a good bit of my early career uh, working with people, individuals in that regard, and and I. Uh, direct the elder law clinic at the University of Alabama School of Law for a period of time uh, before joining the uh, the world of healthcare from the provider's perspective. So what I spend most of my time doing now is uh, advising hospitals, uh, physicians, uh, hospices, nursing homes, assisted living facilities, uh, in their work with uh, aging clients and patients and I'm routinely called upon to uh, advise those providers who are dealing with issues of incapacity, uh, questions over whether a patient has the ability to give informed consent, uh, interpretation of uh, advanced directives and healthcare planning documents. Uh, however, I still have the opportunity occasionally to advise individuals and to speak to groups like you, uh, but I feel like the work that I'm that I've done has really informed the work that I'm doing now uh, because I, I come to the, the healthcare side of things with, I guess, sort of a unique perspective in uh, solving the problems that arise from the point of view of families who are struggling to make difficult decisions or uh, their older family members who are struggling to make difficult decisions or uh, the providers and the families who are struggling to determine whether the older family member even has the ability to make a decision at all. So uh, that's who I am. That's what I do. And i um, happy to be here today and look forward to answering your questions. Thank you, Gaines. Now we have Stephanie Buffalo, who works closely with the Alzheimer's Association and also uh, she and her husband own the Home Instead uh, Care franchise that um, assists so many people with uh, in-home care. So uh, Stephanie, thank you for joining us. And if you'd just tell a little bit more about yourself and your experience. Thank you, I appreciate being here. Um, so my experience started with my grandfather who had Alzheimer's and um, I was able to help our family with taking care of him, but I was really young and I didn't understand much about the disease. Um, moving forward, one of my favorite people in the whole world was my mother-in-law, and I became her person. Um, so in the middle of the night, she would cry out for me. Um, it became really interesting uh, dynamics, and I was her primary caregiver um, with her husband. And I loved my mother-in-law, and I found myself very lost after um, taking care of her for many years. 
And so I found a great network of people um, who helped me to find ways to um, channel that, in, that um, loss. And so um, I did start the home instead in, in Tuscaloosa 10 years ago. Um, and we do take care of senior adults in their homes. Um, and we also go into facilities. Um, I finished my doctorate in trying to find a funding for a cure. Um, and that is really one of my passions. And so that's why I've gotten involved with the Alzheimer's Association. Um, in the last five years, we've done a lot more legislation uh, to try to help fix issues that, the, um, that, that we need to fix, um, elder abuse. And right now we're working on COVID testing in the nursing homes for caregivers so that caregivers can actually go in and see their families. Um, we're working with uh, funding to get more funding for a treatment. Um, and it, then recently I've decided to go to law school because I do feel so passionate about um, the, um, the legislation component of uh, where Alzheimer's, um, they are most vulnerable and they need protection. And so that's kind of where I come from. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, and now uh, Miller Pickett, who is the executive director of Alzheimer's of Central Alabama that um, offers supportive services to so many people. Um, Miller, would you tell us a little bit more about yourself and your agency? Um, <laughs> I, I am Miller Piggott and I'm the executive director of Alzheimer's of Central Alabama. And we're a local nonprofit organization. We were um, founded, actually grew out of a support group that I was leading when I worked at UAB in 1990. So um, we have been serving the, um, the central part of the state for the last 30 years. Our mission is really to provide services that help families keep a loved one at home. Most of the families on our service programs um, um, have very modest incomes, about 70% have incomes that are about $1,500 a month. We provide um, continence products that are delivered to the door, um, and we provide scholarships for people to attend adult daycare centers. Um, of course, our daycare centers are shuttered right now. In addition, we work closely with the um, Sheriff's Department in Jefferson County, and we are the provider for Project Lifesaver. Um, but we do a lot more than that. Um, we have funded um, we've established the Pre-Doctoral Scholars Program in Alzheimer's Disease Research at UAB. Um, we've just named our, our second um, scholar and we're really proud of the work that we've done there. Since 2001, we have funded 24 research grants at Alabama universities that have gone on to lead to over $2 million of additional funding that's been brought into the state for Alzheimer's disease research. Education is a big part of our ministry. Um, we provide regular webinars. That's been one of the good things that's come out of COVID. One of the kind of, I guess, few good things that's kind of come out of COVID, at least from a nonprofit standpoint. And those can be found on our, on our website, um, alzca.org. We've got a whole lot of our local experts, including um, Danny Potts. He's done one for us. Um, so people can have the education that they need right now. Thank you so much, Miller. And um, just before I forget it, because I tend to forget things, uh, which is frightening when we're talking about Alzheimer's disease. But um, one of the things that you mentioned was Project Lifesaver. Uh, and I think that that is, I, I, I need to do a huge plug for that. But if your loved one is mobile, if they can walk, uh, you need to have some kind of GPS tracking device uh, on, you know, on their person at all times. Project Lifesaver is inexpensive. It's offered through local sheriff's departments and nonprofits like uh, ACA and Caring Days and others um, in all the counties in Alabama. And it's offered, you know, in much of the rest of the country and in some other parts of the world. So, um, it's projectlifesaver.org is their website, and um, if you're joining us from somewhere else other than the state of Alabama, um, you, can, you can look it up on their website. Otherwise, you can contact your local sheriff's department uh, to find out if it's offered in your area. It is if you're in the state of Alabama. But um, my, my father-in-law was a wanderer who had Alzheimer's disease. My grandfather had Alzheimer's disease and was a wanderer. 
and uh, you know it, it's um, it's very very important. Uh, and so many of the tragedies that we see in the news every day can be prevented if if uh, you know if there's GPS tracking. Um, now, I think uh -huh. I think a good point that needs to be made and is it, it always seems to shock families is that sixty percent of Alzheimer patients will wander. And so it, it's something that you have to assume might happen to you instead of the opposite, which is thinking, well, that my, my loved one would never do that. Thank so you. It's, it's really important for families to be aware of the prevalence and the dangers of people who wander. That is, that is so, so true. Um, and, you know, having had multiple family members uh, really everybody wandered except for my grandmother who had had a stroke and could not walk. So I, I would, you know, they go to the, to the mailbox and it doesn't look like their house when they, you know, when they turn back around. It, there are so many things that, so many tragedies that could be prevented. So um, thank you for that information. Uh, I would, I can't stress that enough. So thank you for, for mentioning that, Miller. Um, we also have Joan Wells, who is here from Hospice of West Alabama. And so, Joan, would you like to, to say a few words? Yes. Good morning to all. Good morning. Thank you all for inviting me. Uh, I'm Joan Wells with Hospice of West Alabama. I'm the education coordinator. Been with Hospice for 23, 22 years, I'm working on 23. Um, love this place. But we are a nonprofit op uh, nonprofit organization. We've been around since 1982 with our home care program, started our inpatient program in 2004, where we currently have a 15 bed um, unit there on the VA campus. Um, we are very passionate about our patients with um, Alzheimer's. Uh, we see in hospice care, you see the patient and the family as one unit. And most times when patients qualify for hospice care, by the time they're unable um, to walk and um, complete sentences and um, dress themselves, uh, our families are exhausted. So we're coming in then to uh, assist the, uh, the, the patients and the families uh, with the care. The most unfortunate part of, of qualifying for hospice care with an Alzheimer's uh, diagnosis is that you're so far along um, you're so far down the trajectory of the disease and, and families are just, um, you know, again, exhausted, um, means and needs are exhausted. And so we get in there to help with the anxiety, to uh, help with symptom management. Um, we've been fortunate enough to partner with um, Bobby and Stephanie at Home Instead to bring sitters in to, um, you know, just to give our families a break. And thank you so much, Stephanie, for always being available but uh, that is so important to give our families a chance to refresh. We, are, we do allow our patients to come in for five day uh, respite stays once a month, you know, and that just gives the family um, a break to, uh, to unwind and to, to get away from the um, 24 seven caregiving of, of an Alzheimer's uh, patients, patient. So again, thank you for being here and uh, that's what we do. Thank you so much, Joan. And uh, I'll just put in a plug for Hospice of West Alabama, as I know Danny will. Um, my father-in-law, Danny's dad, died uh, at Hospice of West Alabama. And um, we did not enroll him in hospice care until four or five days prior to his passing. And uh, man, I wish, we had, I wish we had enrolled in hospice care much earlier in the process. Uh, you know, people think that hospice care is something that hastens the end or so it, it is not. It is supportive services to, to help people pass in a way that is comfortable for them to make it a comfortable passing and a peaceful passing and uh, to support the family through that. I know the, the, um, the chaplains that you have at hospice are, are wonderful. Uh, we had, you know, family member, my father-in-law, who passed away in the hospice facility at Hospice of West Alabama, and then, uh, you know, my husband's aunt, Danny's aunt, uh, mm -hmm. passed away, but she was not at, um, she was not in the, in the facility, but the supportive services were the same. It was just, it was really wonderful, uh, the, the services that you offer. It's God's own angels. 
Um, and finally, we'll go a little bit out of order. Uh, Danny Potts is a, a neurologist and uh, is a fellow of the American Academy of Neurology, um, an author and a, a passionate, uh, passionate supporter of um, people with Alzheimer's and, and other kinds of dementia and their caregivers. So Danny, would you tell us a little bit about yourself? Oh, I guess so. I'm just thrilled to be a part of the group. Um, uh, I, I can I can sit here during my little brief time and just sing uh, the praises of everybody that's on this panel because I tell you what we have as a family we have utilized all of your <laughs> services and uh, and so uh, I, I can't say enough good things about this group and I also want to say by the way that, that that there are many service organizations in in our community and in your community wherever you may be. And it's not possible to have all of them represented represented for a panel like this. And some people can't come and there are other things going on. But we, our heart goes out to all of the service organizations, the elder care uh, service organizations, uh, the, um, the, healthcare, the healthcare community, all the support services, the legal community, et cetera. We thank you for what you do. I'm a neurologist at the VA. Um, I, I'm an affiliate faculty at University of Alabama. And got into dementia advocacy after my father Lester had uh, Alzheimer's disease. And, um, you know, God does work in mysterious ways. Ellen and I were joined together much before dad had Alzheimer's disease. She had already lived uh, the dementia uh, caregiving situation with, with family members. And so we, we do this as a partnership, but um, I'm thankful to be, uh, to be here. Thank all of you. Thank you, Danny. Um, so I would, uh, I would encourage everyone to pose questions in the chat function um, that's at the bottom in the center. You can uh, click chat and then pose questions and we'll ask those of our subject matter experts. Again, we have uh, medicine uh, and uh, you know, particularly neurology, uh, hospice care, um, and then supportive services and then uh, legal uh, experts who are uh, available on this this Zoom chat session. So, um, Gaines, I would ask you first, um, what are the things that, you know, I, I get the question often, um, you know, I, I don't know that we're prepared. I don't know that we're, uh, you know, we're prepared for this. We don't have any of the legal documents in place and things like that. Um, what what can people do to prepare? Um, and then also, what can you do when you're not prepared and you're already significantly along this journey? So um, there are a number of things that, uh, that individuals can do uh, before they lose capacity to plan for uh, decision making after that occurs. And I usually sort of break it down into two uh, distinct types of uh, decisions because how we plan for them uh, is a little bit different. So there are uh, there are ways to to make uh, plans for financial decision making. And there are ways to make plans for healthcare uh, decision making. And in the state of Alabama, and I have to preface that everything I say as the legal person on this uh, on this panel is that. I am in Alabama. I'm licensed only in Alabama. I've only had practice in Alabama. Uh, many of these principles are fairly broad in uh, the practice of law, but if you are somewhere other than Alabama, uh, you need to, to speak to someone who is um, licensed and knowledgeable in your jurisdiction. Uh, but in the state of Alabama, a person can plan for, uh, for incapacity and in making financial decisions with a durable power of attorney, which is a document that can be um, I would recommend it be prepared by an attorney because there are some pitfalls uh, that were sort of created by our legislature in 2012 in an effort to make the document better. Uh, and it did, but it still made it a little bit more difficult. Uh, so there's durable power of attorney for financial decision making, uh, which allows the person who signs it to um, authorize another person or persons uh, the ability to make decisions in business matters, financial matters, really just about anything you can imagine. Uh, and then there is also a durable healthcare power of attorney, which allows a person to designate an individual who would 
be able to authorize medical care in the event that the person is able to do so. And then in the uh, context of end-of-life decision-making where uh, difficult decisions need to be made about the withdrawal of life-sustaining treatment, there is an advanced directive for with will that can be done um, in advance to authorize, or really not, not authorize, but to document a person's wishes for the type of care they would like to have or not like to have if two doctors agree that they are um, in a terminal situation with no chance of recovery. And, and that covers basically artificial food and hydration and um, medical care procedures uh, that would not cure a person but just keep them alive. Uh, it always provides for palliative care and pain relief, so that's, that's not something you have to worry about giving up. But I could give probably an hour of uh, talk about how those documents work and the intricacies of them, and I won't do that now. But I will say that uh, isn't it's important to think about doing those and to talk about doing those with your uh, with your older family member is that they require all of those documents require a certain level of of mental capacity uh, in order to to sign uh, the person who uh, who would be doing those documents, number one, has to want to and may initially resist the idea of giving up authority to make any kind of decision to another person, even if it's a closely a close trusted relative. Uh, and then once they want to do it, they have to have the level of understanding um, that that is required under the law to, to sign those documents, which is, which is a fairly low level of capacity. It's basically... Uh, is the same capacity that is required to enter into a simple contract under the law, which is that the person who is signing those documents understands and appreciates the import of having that or not having it, and uh, can can articulate maybe why they would want to have it and, and can choose a person that they would designate to make those decisions. Uh, the uh, just a little bit of, of a little bit more depth on each one. The durable power of attorney for financial matters is durable under the law. That means it survives the person's incapacity so that if, if it is signed and that person later becomes incapacitated, it doesn't lose its vitality, which is probably something I think most people would assume, but that's not the default in the law. Um, but that document is set up if it's durable to survive a person's incapacity, it allows financial decision making. The same is true with the healthcare power of attorney. Um, however, it comes into being only when a person is not able to make a decision for themselves. So the, the reason that's important is that if um, a person signs these documents, uh, the healthcare power of attorney, uh, well, really all of them, the durable power of attorney for finances, the healthcare power of attorney, and the advanced directive, they're not giving up their authority and their autonomy to make decisions when they are able to. So you may uh, also want to mention that to an older family member if you're having this discussion with them or, or starting to talk about the idea of, of signing these documents. As long as they can articulate a decision, uh, any kind of decision, then they're going to be able to, to, they're going to, be able to determine their fate or, or not lose the ability make decisions. Now, if they have failed to make these uh, kinds of advanced plans and they are either in a in um, a position where they can't communicate at all or uh, they are not, they clearly don't have the capacity to make and articulate a, a decision under the law, then uh, the options are are more limited they're difficult and they're costly, uh, typically. So uh, if you have a situation where um, a decision needs to be made and the, the person clearly doesn't have capacity, and I say clearly because I'm uh, making a huge leap here, a lot of the times um, when these situations, when these controversies arrive, arise, there is not, it is not clear whether the person has capacity. And that's, another, that's a topic for another discussion. But if it's clear that they don't have capacity and a decision must be made, 
about health care, then it may be necessary for uh, the family or for someone to go to court and to obtain a guardianship to make personal care decisions or a conservatorship to make uh, financial decisions. Uh, those processes are very long, they're very costly, uh, and, in, and it depends on where you live, just the access to the have to the courts and, and a timely decision. Um, every county is different in how they do the proceedings, how long they take to make the decisions. Um, and I won't talk in depth about how that works, but the point of that is to hopefully encourage you from encourage you to make advanced plans so that you're not stuck having to go to court to have someone designated by a court um, to make decisions. Now, there are other uh, options aside from guardianship that depend on the condition of the, of the person. Um, if, if we're talking about someone who needs uh, acute inpatient mental health care because they're a danger to themselves or others, uh, that requires an involuntary or may require an involuntary commitment proceeding, uh, which is a petition that's filed by a person who um, is looking out for someone else but prosecuted, for lack of a better word, by the state. Uh, that is an even more unpleasant proceeding to go through. I had to go through it with my father, uh, and I highly recommend avoiding that if at all possible, but that's sometimes that is a proceeding that when it is needed, it often is not, avoid, is not avoidable. So uh, that's another Another proceeding that can be used to care for a person with an acute mental health problem uh, who is a danger to themselves or others, uh, the uh, Department of Human Resources Adult Protective Services can also step in in situations where a person is maybe not a danger, not violent, but is unable to care for themselves. Uh, and that is a similar but uh, related proceeding to the two I just described. So. Uh, the, the moral of this story, I guess to sum up what I've just said, is plan if you can uh, and do it through the documents that I described rather than having to wait until it's too late because all of those documents require a level of capacity under the law to sign, and if that's absent, uh, then something needs to be done that may require uh, resorting to the courts. That, believe it or not, is a pretty short way of describing those things. There's a lot of ins and outs, twists and turns to, to every every one of those things. But that's that's basically the um, the, the broad view. Thank you, Gaines. Uh, I would I would say that uh, Gaines works with a firm called Maynard Cooper in uh, in Birmingham, but also there are federally funded elder law clinics around the country. Uh, there is one at the University of Alabama that offer free services. Um, if you're not in West Alabama, you can uh, contact your local bar association or your state bar association and they should be able to tell you where the, the elder law clinic that serves your area um, is located and how to get in touch with, uh, with that clinic. Um, we have a question from a, a participant. What can a family member do when it is the primary care person, i.e. the spouse in this case, who is in denial about the limitations of the person with dementia, especially where safety is concerned uh, for instance, with wandering. Um, so I, I assume that, uh, you know, the, the spouse thinks that everything is fine. What, and I would throw that out to the panel and anyone who would like to comment. I would like to comment if that's okay. Yes. Sure. Bunny, I think that's a great question. And I'll kind of give you a personal experience. Um, my father showed all the signs and his wife is a nurse. Um, and so I will say with my mother-in-law, I was in denial and as a professional seeing it every day, it was, it didn't occur to me when my mother-in-law was running through red lights or when she was um, telling me I was fat every five minutes that it was the dementia talking. <laughs> so it took me a moment to figure out that um, that was a situation. So sometimes the people closest can be the ones that do not see it. Um, my father had actually said that if he found out that if he had Alzheimer's, he would put a gun to his head and kill himself. And so no one wanted to tell him. And so I ended up having some long conversations and I took him to a doctor um, and we had to rule out a lot of things because my father had some um, 
external issues of depression with um, Vietnam and, and different issues. And we actually went to the VA and they were really great with him. And we actually had him committed for that during that time um, so that he could work through those issues. And so it was not an easy process. Um, and my father will say, if you don't want to know the answer, don't ask me <laughs> because I will be bluntly honest. And I said, dad, if you have Alzheimer's, I would encourage you to get into a clinical trial and not kill yourself because we need you. And so when I changed that conversation and that dynamic, the, and I started taking them to the doctors, I would show them black and white, this is what the doctors say. And um, it started showing, it started helping them to understand that we have an issue and that they needed to put some parameters in place and not let him do as he's always done. And now they come to me and they go, well, you know what's wrong with your dad, right? I was like, I was the one that told you, but okay. <laughs> so sometimes that primary caregiver can be very um, difficult. So I think showing them in black and white is a very big thing for, for me in the professional side of it. I encourage families to get that care planning. Care planning is, is just that um, as a person gets older, you need to prepare kind of like uh, Gaines was just talking about, and I appreciate the work he does. You've got to start preparing for things. And so getting that care plan, especially for people who have dementia is extremely important. Um, and so I think that when you get the doctors involved um, and maybe say, you know, their, who their primary is, get that information and say, Hey, would you mind looking at the neurology or sending them to a neurologist and getting them tested? Um, I was saying in the last chat with a caregiver meeting, uh, or the caregiver panel, there is a um, blood test coming out hopefully soon. And so instead of that mini mental test, because I hate when doctors do it in the mornings, because whether you're having a good day or a bad day, it could be subjective and it could be a little bit, and, and I think good neurologists can see through that. Um, but we're actually trying to get a center for excellence in Birmingham is one of our goals and in, in, um, looking at preventative measures and um, that kind of thing. And so I think that it is a difficult thing. I think that when you have that wondering first, they have to acknowledge the issue that they are more forgetful, that they're having more issues and that they need more care um, and they need more resources. And so when you open up that door of the acknowledgement of it and then go through the care planning of it, then you can get to the wandering behavior and, and hopefully utilize that um, project lifesaver and things like that. So hopefully that answered. I would, oh, I would say, I was going to say between Danny and me, we have had eight family members who have had either Alzheimer's disease or vascular dementia that we and our immediate families have cared for. And we've been in denial eight times. So, you know, you would think not our first rodeo. No, it doesn't matter. You, you still, you, you see the person with, with your, you bring your own lens, you know? And so uh, denial is, is such a, an issue. Um, but Danny, what, what would you like, how would you like to address this? Oh, I was going to, I was going to say that, um, uh, that, you know, and I agree so much with what, what Stephanie said, you know, I was uh, a neurologist who was uh, in denial about my father's condition. So what I was going to say, in addition to agreeing with her is that a third party entity has got to come in and help the person see that this is what's going on. And, and, I, and I, I ideally would like to say that that almost always could be a healthcare provider. However, I will also say that not all healthcare providers are, are as well versed in dementia care uh, in, 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 in uh, the ways to, to speak dementia, so, so to speak. Um, and so it might be someone uh, like Miller Piggott or Stephanie Buffalo or John Wells, someone that, that um, is in the community in a support organization or, or in, in an affiliate organization that deals with dementia and that understands it. That can be the third party that helps the, care, the caregiver, the primary caregiver see the light. So I think it, it, it requires that we, um, that, that we uh, know a little bit about dementia in, in, in the day-to-day -day sort of reality of it to be able to advise, but it takes a third party, I think, to do that. My, my favorite quote on, on denial is, is this, it's um, acceptance is not submission. It's the acknowledgement of the facts of the situation and then deciding what you're gonna do about it. And that is what is so difficult is that acceptance forces you to move forward. It forces you to change your own behaviors, to change your own family dynamics, so to speak. And so people are very reluctant oftentimes to do that. 
And, you know, I, I don't know who that question came from, but a lot of times I hear um, adult children saying that they have more difficulty with their well parent than they do with the one who has got dementia because they have such difficulty getting that well parent on board with the changes that need to be made. So education is the real key to that. And as Danny said, getting a third party involved is really the way to go because that helps keep family tension down. Thank you. Um, we have another question. It says, when a person no longer drives and their driver's license has expired, is it needful to get an ID card from the driver's license division or do I need to alert the state regarding the fact that he's a non-driver now? Um, you know, I, I could start with that. Um, I am not aware, and Gaines may be able to help us or maybe somebody else, I'm not aware of, of an ID card of any kind that uh, is given out by the, by the state uh, to people that can no longer drive. Somebody correct me if I'm wrong. Um, I don't think it would be a bad idea to report uh, that, uh, that to the state, that your loved one is not driving any longer. Um, I, I, I don't think it's necessary um, to do that. I think Alabama is a, is a state that, that works sort of on the, the honor system regarding that in terms of reporting that, but I could be wrong. Somebody, somebody correct me. There, you can get a, 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 an ID card um, from the, the DMV or whatever we are calling it now um, that is a non-driver ID card, if that's, if that's the question, because they're, you know, even after a person stops driving, there are, or, or some people who never drove, there are, um, there's a need for, for an ID in a lot of cases. Um, so that's something that can, can be obtained, uh, whether it's for somebody who's never driven or for somebody who no longer drives. Um, at the DMV, and there is a, a procedure, I believe, I've, I think I've only ever had to do it once a long time ago or assist somebody with it um, for reporting someone that you don't think should be driving. Uh, I, I, I kind of concur with Danny here, you know, if, if we're talking about supporting the autonomy of a person, uh, you know, we have to be really sure about doing that, um, recognizing that you know, you're, you're really limiting someone's mobility. Of course, it may be someone who clearly does not need to be driving anymore. And it's in the interest of public safety, they don't need to, to be driving. Um, and, and I believe there is a procedure on the Alabama Law Enforcement Agency website for doing that. I couldn't tell you any more about how to find it. Uh, but I think there is some information on that website about that. Uh, but I just encourage you to proceed lightly there, uh, recognizing also that that for someone who doesn't need to be driving, simply not having a driver's license may not be enough to keep them from driving. Uh, so, you know, if you're in, if you're to the point with someone where they, you think they are becoming becoming more dangerous behind the wheel, I think you have to ease into that. Um, I think you have to ease into that transition, and it shouldn't be just taking the keys away overnight. Uh, mm -hmm. So, I don't know, answering a question that wasn't asked or not, but that's uh, that's how I interpreted that. I apologize. I, I was going to share that we would use it as like the grandkids really need your car. They can't get back and forth to school and you don't really go very many places. And we just, we, we need, they need to use your car. And so then we kind of transition the car out from their <laughs> world. That's actually the way that my parents got my grandmother not to drive. It's they said, Oh, you know, Ellen's 16 and we don't have the money to buy her a car and she needs to get to school and to work and things. And what are we going to do? And my grandma said, Oh, well, you know, I would give her my car, you know? And so that, that was how my parents transitioned. So that's a lovely way to make that work. Um, we have several legal questions. Um, one of them gains is, you know, let's say that, uh, let's say that Danny is not, has, you know, God forbid has Alzheimer's and he's not capable of driving, but yet I, I as his spouse have not taken the keys away. Um, is there any way that I could be liable for that? Or, um, you know, if a family member falls and gets hurt, is there any way if, 
if I have not taken appropriate precautions for whatever could have happened, whether it's him being injured or another person, um, could I, could the family be held liable for that? Uh, the short answer is no. Uh, there's, there's not really a way under the law that you can, um, that you can blame someone else for, um, for not protecting them from another adult. Um, it, it's different for, you know, the parent of a, of a minor, but even in the case where a person has been not, has been named by the court as someone's guardian, they have limited liability for, um, the acts and omissions of their, of, of the person that they're looking out after. So, uh, so if it's a spouse or another adult, uh, there is, there's not really any liability in the state of Alabama, at least, for um, not taking actions uh, that would protect the public from that person. Um, and there's, you know, a lot of reasons why that's the law, but that's, that's basically the law. So, no, uh, you're not going to be held responsible for, for not taking the keys away or, um, you know, not doing something to protect the public against that or protect the public from that person. Thanks, Keynes. Um, and this is really a, a general question. Um, if, if there's, and it's not necessarily a legal one, but it, there may or may not be a will. What do you do in regard to the personal belongings, the furniture, the, you know, the jewelry or the, you know, the clothing, all of those kinds of things when someone passes away. Um, and I'll just tell you the way that, uh, my my mom did it. She has two brothers, and there are you know several several uh, children of that of her generation. And basically, when they cleaned out the house, she started with the oldest grandchild and said, "What do you want out of the house?" Um, her brothers, you know, they they didn't want things out of the house really, and so she started with the oldest grandchild and said, "Pick one thing." you know, what do you want? And then they went down from there to the youngest grandchild and then they started back over again at the top. And, uh, you know, it was, it was a way to kind of relative it in a relatively fair fashion to, uh, to split things up without getting people, you know, sometimes families uh, with grief, emotions are always running high and, you know, they may get, uh, tensions may run high. What, what other thoughts do y'all have on, on that? Uh, I totally agree. Anytime you can avoid the law to do it, um, <laughs> which may, may be an odd thing to hear coming from a lawyer, but, um, uh, I will say if we're talking about the, uh, division of property after someone's death, when there is not a will, which I think was the question, um, keep in mind a couple of things. A court proceeding to deal with the property of a decedent is only required when there is personal property over which people are fighting. In other words, the family can't decide on a on an equitable distribution distribution of personal property. And by personal property, I mean anything that's not a real estate or land or uh, uh, basically anything that's not real estate. And a court proceeding is required to transfer title of property that has a title, like land, real estate, that hasn't otherwise been um, uh, dealt with. Uh, so, for instance, there is um, a house or land that on the deed only had the name of the person who died. Um, a court proceeding would be required to transfer that property in a way that someone else could actually do something with it, um, like get a mortgage on it or, you know, build a house on it or sell it easily. And if that's not done, you have what's called air property, which just sort of passes by operation of law through the generations, and it's, it, it's hard to deal with air property. Um, if the decedent just dies with a bank account in only their name, then a court proceeding may be required um, to transfer the title of that. Um, but depending on how much is in the account, it could be an abbreviated proceeding in the state of Alabama. Um, but as for everything else, like the things Don describes, uh, furniture, knickknacks, um, clothing, keepsakes, all of those things can be just split up if everybody agrees. Um, and by everybody, I mean everyone who might have 
a legal claim to those things as an heir at law or, um, you know, who might disagree with how the family is dividing them. So, so big things like land, if they're only in the name of the person who died, may need a probate proceeding. Of course, the way to avoid that is to, you know, to have a deed during that person's life prepared that names a uh, surviving owner so that it passes automatically. And with the same can be done or similar procedure can be done with bank accounts and retirement accounts to name a survivor or beneficiary on those accounts. So there's a lot of advanced planning that can be done there, too, to avoid the need of, of a court proceeding. But for ordinary, everyday stuff, everybody agrees you can just divide it. Thank you, Gaines. Um, Joan, I would love for you to comment about, about when it's appropriate to start thinking about hospice care and about when it's appropriate to um, start thinking about that. I know uh, we did not do that until very late in the process, and, and I think that we missed out on a lot of support that would have been tremendously helpful in our caregiving journey that, uh, that we, was available through hospice that we did not take advantage of. So could you speak to that? Yes. CMS, our Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, um, say that criteria for admission to, hospice, to a hospice program is that there's a terminal diagnosis, prognosis of six months or less to live, and for hospices that they live within a 50 mile radius of the service area. So especially with, um, with, with the diagnosis of Alzheimer's or dementia diseases, um, you want to start looking at it when the patient um, starts to change, when there's uh, problems with the everyday uh, activities of daily living, uh, bathing, uh, uh, dressing, uh, feeding themselves. And again, as I mentioned earlier, it's very unfortunate that you have to get to that point before you qualify but um you know for for this disease but any of the other ones some of the other uh criteria you're admitted to the program by diagnosis and each diagnosis has criteria for admission so you know some of the other diagnoses um certainly you know you don't have to be at this point but alzheimer's again unfortunately you have to be there but uh the, the hospice program is an interdisciplinary team approach to care so there's uh, the medical directors, there's nurses, there's social workers, chaplains, aides, um, homemakers, and, um, and volunteers. So certainly all of those um, disciplines are in there to care for the patient and the family as one unit. So, um, you know, it's very beneficial to, if you have a terminal diagnosis, to, um, to become a, pro, uh, a part of this program to help with the um, the symptom management, um, support of the caregivers. Um, we have a 13-month a bereavement program after the family, after the patient dies to support the, 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 the caregiver um, post-death. We have a bereavement counselor on staff to deal with um, the changes or anticipatory um, grief. And, and all those things are, are beneficial. And one thing I've learned um, with, with Alzheimer's is that there's so many losses along the way. So there's so many um, things to grieve along the way um, long before the death occurs. There's so many, uh, you know, uh, changes that people grieve losing the person and you, you know, the losses are so, uh, there's a, just a list of them. So um, it's definitely a benefit to be a part of that program just to have that, uh, that support in there in the home. Joan, we have a question. Um, do you have to wait until the patient is bed bound before admitted admission to hospice care? Absolutely not. Now, if we're dealing with um, again Alzheimer's, but you don't have the, they don't have to be bed bound. They, um, you know, they can have difficulty ambulating. They can um, have some of those uh, unable to to form a complete sentence. Um, what are the other criteria? Um, unable to bathe and walk, but you know, but they can still be ambulatory. They don't have to be bed bound. Even if outside of the Alzheimer's um, diagnosis, our patients does not do not have to be bed bound or homebound. You know, we have patients that 
we contract with other hospices if they want to go on vacation or you know they they want to we encourage them to live until the very uh second they die so we uh you know we're they're not forced to 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 be in home uh homebound like in a home health uh, program so no ma'am they don't have to be bed bound um and i think that there are uh aren't there things that are covered by medicare under hospice care that are not covered by medicare if you're not under hospice care can you can you speak to that a little bit yes ma'am uh, when you a person has medicare or medicaid when they become that when they enter the hospice um, umbrella they then then elect the hospice medicare or medicaid benefit so it is an extra layer of support or a benefits on top of their normal um, Medicare Medicaid. And it, it deals specifically with the terminal diagnosis. So if a person is admitted with lung cancer and they um, have another disease or they're admitted with Alzheimer's and they have uh, another, uh, they have heart disease or in stage lung disease. So the Medicare, the hospice Medicare benefit would cover just the Alzheimer's uh, diagnosis. And then their regular Medicare would would um, would entail everything else that deals with the other diagnosis they have. So it is definitely an added bonus. It is free. There's no out of uh, out of cost um, out of pocket cost, and it deals with everything that has to do with the the diagnosis, medications, um, treatments, supplies. Um, you know, supplements are built, are brought in. Um, just anything and everything. Medications are all covered. Now, one thing, well, like I said, I mentioned with when we um, use uh, Stephanie or Home Instead for our sitter service uh, for our patients, that is something outside of the hospice Medicare benefit. That is something that, as a as a as a program, we decided to do to support the family. So that is from community do uh, donations and just. Uh, funding from the, the hospice agency to support the families, but everything else that mm -hmm. deals with the patient care, all support services, medications, treatment, equipment, everything comes, falls under the Medicare benefit for that diagnosis. Thanks so much, Joan. Um, Miller, could you speak to, uh, you know, we're in the middle of a pandemic and the dementia daycare centers are closed and the all of the, the difficulties that have been caused, can you speak to supportive services that are available to families uh, during this time? Well, many of the adult daycare centers and in particular our respite centers, I'm not sure if y'all are familiar what respite centers are. There's not one in Tuscaloosa right now, but they're, they're a four hour program. Therefore, um, they, they match caregiver, they match a, a volunteer with the person with dementia. So when you walk in the room, it's just everybody having fun. And you can't, you don't even know who's got dementia and who doesn't. They have been very creative in doing drive-bys and parades. They have tried to do things on Zoom. They've tried to do activity buckets um, that are delivered to the homes. And those things are really difficult because what we find is that the real benefit of daycare or the respite programs was the respite. You know, it's, it's, that's what the caregiver primarily needs. And to provide them a bucket of activities is almost like giving a, a, an overburdened caregiver more work to do. And so although there have been some families that have really appreciated that, not all have. So I think everybody is trying to figure out how to pivot um, and how to continue to provide support. Uh, moral support works really, really well because that's the one thing everyone needs right now. And we try to stay in touch with all 250 of the people on our service programs. Again, as I said, many of these, most of these are low income families and they were contacting us because they didn't have masks. And so last week and week before last, we organized what we called emergency medical kits. We had all of those delivered. 30 of those were delivered in Tuscaloosa County because we work closely with Caring Days Adult Daycare Center and fund scholarships for many of the participants at that daycare. 
So we're, we're working constantly to, to look for new and creative ways um, to provide that kind of support that families need. Thank you. And, and by the way, talk to me later if you need more masks, because I've got lots and lots of them through uh, Habitat for Humanity where I work. So well, we, we actually distributed uh, a, 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 about 6,500 masks. Um, wow, to, that's awesome. To our, to our family. So um, they're, they, they're at least covered for now. So we were really, really glad to be able to do that. And the, the folks that um, uh, the First United Methodist Church in Tuscaloosa helped with the deliveries in your county. And so we're grateful to their support, their volunteer support of what we're doing. That is awesome. Um, I, would, I would say, I know that uh, some of the things that people often tell me um, in terms of support is, and, and that we've been, you know, seen this in our own family, that often the, the other family members who are not the primary caregivers, who are, are you know, the friends, um, kind of desert you. And then there's also this, uh, you know, this thing with caregivers and, you know, speaking from personal experience, well, I should be able to do this myself. You know, I, sh I should be able to do this. I don't need help. Um, so I think, I think there's a two-sided thing there, but I would encourage caregivers that, uh, you know, when somebody says, oh, you know, what can I do to help you? You know, and you just say, oh, I'm fine. Have a list, you know, have a list. Uh, and especially during this time, you need more support rather than less. And, uh, you know, there are, uh, my college roommate uh, used to say that she, her son was going to choose her nursing home and her daughter was going to pay for it because they have very different personalities. But um, think about the, the people in your family. Uh, you know, it, there are some people you might say, I need you to come from this time to this time to come help care for my, you know, for your father or for your love, you know, whoever the loved one is. And there may be people who you say, here's the grocery list and my credit card. I need you to go, you know, buy the groceries or, or whatever the situation may be, but, um, but reach out, you know, for supportive services uh, often and, and early. Um, I'm trying to see if we have any other questions. Are there any other questions that anyone has um, for, via the chat function? Please uh, text them or type them in now. Also, do any of our panelists, do you have anything else that you would like to say um, and words of wisdom or, or good thoughts? Ellen, I wanted to uh, mention a couple of things. Um, one is that uh, the Area Agency on Aging um, uh, want, want, wanted to be involved today and, and was unable to, to be involved today. But let me tell you, they do a great job in the community uh, and in your community as well. Uh, uh, with services that they offer. So uh, remember uh, in, our, in our area, the West Alabama Area Agency on Aging, but uh, they're, they're in, in, in all districts and in, in uh, all states. Uh, the other thing is that um, people are making use of technology in, uh, during this time. And uh, uh, as many of you know from this morning, if you were on the, uh, attended the uh, caregiver panel, Dr. Don Windorf, who is a musician, uh, and his friends who are musicians have gotten some sing-along videos together uh, that uh, are, are very helpful. And if you go to YouTube and put in Don Windorf's name, W-E-N-D-O-R-F, you'll find some of those um, as well. I also would say that um, organizations like um, some of the life story organizations that um, provide you uh, tools to digitally record, you know, your loved one's narrative, your loved one's life story, um, including lifebio.com. Um, they have a, a group of students all across the country that right now is um, uh, able to call people in residential care facilities and speak with them or FaceTime with them and, and record a life story for you. And I think Miller, y'all, I uh, think it, it works some with that program. And so there are ways to connect, you know, using technology, especially around the arts and life story. I don't know if anybody has any more comments about that. Uh, I, I do, I just, as a, I guess a couple of uh, parting remarks from me. Number one, I, I just wanna amplify as much as I can all the things that 
that Danny uh, just mentioned, particularly the area agencies on aging, which exist everywhere. Uh, ours in West Alabama is just a real treasure in the community in terms of what they do and the passion they bring to their work. Uh, but no matter where you are, if you dial 1-800-AGE-LINE, uh, you'll be connected with the area agency on aging for your area. Uh, and they will connect you with um, resources like the, the uh, legal uh, resources Ellen mentioned earlier. Uh, they, they help out with open enrollment. They help people pick the right Part D drug plan. Uh, all those things are just uh, such a huge resource. And, and as, your, as your final remark, um, as your legal panelist, I will say just a couple of do's and don'ts. Do plan early in terms of the, uh, the documents that I mentioned earlier for uh, incapacity and for a time when not able when your loved one is not able to make decisions but don't rush to a lawyer to solve a caregiving dispute um, i mentioned some of the options that people have to resort to if they've not made plans some of the legal proceedings that are available under the law uh, those are to be avoided at all costs and not every lawyer that you might go to to help you with a guardianship or other protective proceeding uh, will have the uh, discretion to try to talk you out of this. Uh, but that's good. And if you are having a, dis a disagreement or um, are at odds with the primary caregiver or with a sibling or someone else in your family over, over what needs to be done or what should be done, remember the the person is at the center of this, so their wishes should be honored and considered to the extent they can be. And if at all possible, resolve the disagreement among others through a third party, uh, whether that's a, a trusted physician or a social worker or in some ju jurisdictions around the country, there are uh, such things as, as uh, elder law mediators that are, that are coming into uh, to being. So try to find a way past the disagreement that you're having over what should be done and remember why uh, you're having the discussion and involve the person as much as possible. And, and whatever you do, don't rush to a lawyer to file something in court unless there is absolutely no other option. So that's my two cents. Ellen, I want to say, you know, it, it, it seems like whenever um, I participate in something like this or we put on an educational program, that one of the comments that we get is that, gosh, I wish I'd known this earlier. You know, I wish I'd had access to this information earlier. And so I just want to say to the caregivers that, that are, um, have participated in this this morning, you now have so many of the answers and you, the people that you, to church with and when they have a need um, or they have a question about Alzheimer's now you have some of the answers to be helpful not just for yourself but for other people and I think a lot of caregivers find meaning through that and find purpose through that and that's a really good way to stay um, feeling empowered and it, it also speaks to the, the power of support groups because everybody needs one so that's my parting shot Absolutely. Thank you so much, Miller. And, and in terms of resources, I know that um, on your website, you've got a tremendous number of resources. Um, there's a resource page on the, the conference website for today, um, which is www.fpctusc.org slash dementia. And I'll type that into the chat function. Um, there are, you know, the, the Alzheimer's of Central Alabama, Alzheimer's Foundation of America, Alzheimer's Association, there are resources out there, um, Hospice of West Alabama, um, Area Agency on Aging, they, they are out there, um, but you do have to reach out for help. Um, and, uh, you know, you're, you're exactly right that it's very empowering and you see so many in our panelists today that their lives have been personally touched by uh, Alzheimer's and other kinds of dementia, and they want to um, help those who are coming, you know, through it right now after, you know, help them and, and to share the words of wisdom that they uh, have learned through the School of Hard Knocks. 
Um, anyone else have any, any other comments? I'll say that um, to back up what Jane was saying, we um, used hospice West Alabama with my mother-in-law. And when I said, I think she needs hospice, but I'm not sure. Can you come and do an evaluation? And they did a free evaluation. And so you literally have nothing to lose if you feel like that person is at that place. And I can tell you that my father, my grandfather had it like for one day. And then when my mother-in-law had it, it was just a world of difference to have that support system. And in any way you can get that support system, whether it's through Central Alabama or the Alzheimer's Association, anybody who can come around you and support you. And, and again, the support groups are, are great. Um, I would encourage you if you are going to get a caregiver to screen them thoroughly. Um, background checks are a really great thing in my world. Um, and what we found out is kind of scary because that person who you've been to church with forever, you know, you want to, you want to make sure that they're, they're good. But on the flip side of that is to protect yourself. When you have someone coming into your home that you do not know, um, safeguard those things, um, checkbooks and credit cards, and just go through a, a, a way of, of not to scare you. But the, the best problem is the one that didn't happen in your home. Um, and just also to give yourself grace, know that, that um, God will never leave you nor forsake you. And when we cry out to him, he is there. And um, just give yourself that that moment where you say it's okay to have a bad day and with Alzheimer's, you're going to have those bad days. And so the more support system that you can have, the better, um, because then you have a, a greater resource. Ellen, you know, you and I have learned so much from so many uh, care partners and people living with dementia uh, during this walk that we've had. One of those people is Dr. James M. Houston, who is a, who is a 98 year old theologian uh, in Vancouver. Um, Dr. Mike Parker, who is a retired social worker here, or a professor of social work at the University of Alabama, uh, who is uh, one of the mentees of Dr. Houston, uh, has founded a center called the James Houston Center for Faith and Successful Aging, uh, which is kind of his retirement work. And that center does have a repository of resources and, and uh, experts who deal with the field of aging. Uh, in, in there lies dementia, so it's a much broader broader picture in terms of, of, of aging, but uh, I, I encourage you to, to find them online as well. Joan, did you have a comment? Yes, ma'am. I, I just want to briefly expand on the, um, the question that was asked about, do you have to be bed bound or, or just briefly on the length of stay? Although the criteria is six months or less to live, we really need at least six months at a minimum in there to to work the hospice magic, to do the, you know, to, to help the, the families prepare, to support them as needed. So we don't, we, you know, we want more than six months. So we want the, um, want the patient admitted as soon as possible so that we could, uh, you know, get in there and, and do those anticipatory um, talks about how this disease will progress, what kind of things or services, services are available how we could be of most assistance and to develop a rapport with the patient and family so that we can have a good relationship towards the end. So definitely not the six months. If we can get them in there earlier, that's the, you know, that's the goal. Um, so, you know, we, we have patients sometimes that we have on service for up to two years. They still meet criteria, criteria for no curative uh, method out there, but certainly we want more than, than the minimum. Thank you so much. Um, we are, I'm really uh, so, so grateful to everyone who participated.